So today, um, if you don't know, you might not, is um, a, a sermon that was um, bid upon at our goods and services auction. Keith Munich, our lovely Keith Munich Kurt, over here. Kurt, Kurt. 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 <laughs> <laughs> I should just lie down and give up now. <laughs> Her unit, I thought it was going to be, I thought to myself, you know, it's not going to be a lot of funny in this sermon. So, <laughs> thank, uh, fortunately, my brain fixed that for us. Mm -hmm. um, Kurt Munich and I sat down and talked, and he, you know, he had thought a lot about what he wanted to hear about, and this was his question, it was the question about the separation between church and religion, or church and uh, medicine, separation between church and medicine. And uh, most particularly around that whole idea that uh, the Al Jazeera article lifted up, the question about particularly hospital care, as, as health care gets taken over in some measure um, by Catholic uh, institutions. I, not until I was talking with Kurt did it dawn on me that my family is presently receiving health uh, care from a, a, a branch of Providence um, and realized suddenly that my family is being cared for by Catholic physicians and that may have, or by a Catholic healthcare organization, and that may have some problems um, for me. Um, I haven't paid a lot of attention to this issue, quite honestly, um, but I have noticed um, it has popped up a couple of places in my life, and so I'm, uh, I'm aware of it and have now done a little more looking and a little more thinking about it. Um, the situation is, as described again in this, and perhaps many of you have been following this more, um, the question about mergers between secular hospitals and Catholic hospitals. And, and in those mergers, at least so it seems, the Catholic moral theology that informs Catholic health care is still in place, even though it is a combining of two yeah, um, organizations. Here, Sorry? That's what exactly what happened with the Providence. That's what happened with Providence here, indeed. It used to be a public, now it's a Catholic. The, 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 the crossover. Um, the number of people who now have only Catholic hospitals available to them is growing. Um, and that has, that has some difficulties associated with it, as you might um, expect. I want to share a couple of perspectives with you about um, some experiences that I've had with Catholic um, healthcare and non-Catholic healthcare. The first was um, a long time ago, back when I was in my training for ministry, all ministers are required to take a unit of what they call clinical pastoral education. It's an opportunity to experience yourself in a pastoral role as you are training for ministry. Typically it's done in a healthcare facility. Some people do it in other institutions like prisons and there's some other versions around. I did mine in a Catholic hospital. Um, and oddly enough, I did mine in a Catholic hospital, both because I happened to be living in Minneapolis at the time, and because in St. Paul, across the river, was the single Unitarian Universalist clinical pastoral education supervisor in the entire country at a Catholic hospital. <laughs> How he did that, I have no idea, um, but, but that was, his, that was his, his main work. That was the place he did most of his work. And so I worked in that hospital, and the first few days that we were there, um, the priest came in and talked with us about what our responsibilities as chaplain were. And some of them were very easy and really um, simple to figure out. The um, rounds of communion had to be done by a baptized Christian, which left me out. I wasn't able to do that. I've never been baptized. Um, but I did, when I did my overnights at the hospital, we all, were all required to do that, I did walk around with the, um, either the nun who was doing it or the Catholic laywoman who was doing it, and uh, it was quite moving to go with them and, and do that. The other thing that was just really interesting to me during that time was the fine distinctions that the priest made about what to do in the maternity world. And I, I had heard, you know, the stand, pin, angels dancing on the head of a pin kind of distinctions. Um, and I was, I was struck that the priest took a lot of time to talk to us about when we could baptize and when we would not be allowed to baptize uh, a, a child born um, in that 
Maternity ward, yeah, I know, I have the same, so Sarah's here scowling, what? Um, I had the same sort of experience. I thought, well, th isn't that interesting? Wouldn't you, if the parents said, oh, please baptize, wouldn't you baptize that child? And the priest was very clear with us. He had no doubt at all. He was very clear, we do not baptize dead things. So if the child is still born, you may not, you may not, under any circumstances, baptize that child. A little horrified. I trust that the nurses, to whom they really see most of that decision making, would do what was right, from my perspective at least, and do whatever that grieving parent needed at the moment. I trust that to be the case. But when you're guided by Catholic moral theology, you follow the prescriptions that are laid in there. We'll talk more about that later. The second perspective is having lived for six years in a country where health care was entirely secular and provided for everyone. I was stunned um, in, late in my time there to receive an um, invitation from the local crisis pregnancy center. Now, in this country, when people talk about the crisis pregnancy center, all of our flags go up. These are anti-abortion people. These are people who want to convince you that what you need to do is have this baby, whether you want to or not, right? That's what we know. They're the ones who put up those horrible signs and who, who, um, who bully women, uh, or at least that's how I think about them. I was surprised to discover that crisis pregnancy centers are an arm of the NHS and therefore must provide all options to all women who come there, who have a crisis pregnancy. And I went to a, a forum that they had there, um, specifically for pastors, specifically for ministers, and was very nervous going in. I was just absolutely certain that this was going to be the kind of horrifying thing that I imagined I might have if I went to the same sort of thing here, and was profoundly moved um, by the woman who was presenting, who is a fundamentalist Christian, very conservative Christian, vehemently opposed to abortion but who had realized that in those congregations there were women who had had abortions, maybe before they became Christian, maybe while they were as a part of that congregation, and who lived with shame and hatred of themselves, and that those women needed to be embraced back into the church, not judged, but given the loving heart of God. I was totally moved by this woman, and, and when I went up to speak with her afterwards, I said, you know, you and I are at opposite ends, but I admire you, and I appreciate what you do, and um, this is really important. That's a difference when you have a secular healthcare system that, we can, uh, that, that doesn't have the kind of intensity that there is around issues around reproductive women's, women's reproductive health here in this country. So that's where one of the big rubs is, though, is when we get into the question of um, reproductive health. For me, when I first started thinking about this, I thought, of course, about my daughter, Claire, who's 13 now. And, um, and I have a lot of confidence that even if our local hospital is Roman Catholic, that I have a lot of confidence that I'll get her whatever resources she needs for birth control, if she has a pregnancy that is unintended, that we will cope with it in a way that makes sense for her and for our family. Um, I have a just huge confidence that we're able to do that. However, when we start stepping into non-emergency care, or in, yes, when, um, we can get her non-emergency care even if abortion services are, are needed. We know how to do that. Um, what's hard though is that for a lot of folks, um, particularly in some areas of the country, the only option is that local Roman Catholic church, or lo local Roman Catholic hospital, um, and sometimes uh, that can be a problem. In one of the articles I read, they told the story of um, a Catholic facility in Arizona, and a woman who was admitted to this facility who um, was in uh, extreme condition. She was pregnant. Um, she needed, uh, the, the choice